Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Monday, May 9th, 2022. I'm Maggie Lake, and here with me today is Jared Dillian, editor of the Daily Dirt Nap newsletter. Hi there, Jared. Hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing okay. As, as best as can be expected, I guess, as we're looking to this uh, at the beginning of what is a really rough start to the week. It's kind of a gruesome picture. Um, U.S. equities deep in the red and the selling seems to be intensifying into the close with um, tech and small caps bearing the brunt of the selling. The Nasdaq off. Uh, where are we right now? Um, four and a quarter percent. Uh, we've got the S&P 500 down three and change below 4,000, the Russell down four and a quarter. Uh, the yields on the 10-year climbed to 3.17% before retracing. Now that's at about 303 uh, And And it's one of these days where l- there's lots of stuff down, right? It's not just equities, gold's down, oil down 6%, crypto's getting hit really hard. Bitcoin down 11%, Ethereum down 12%. One of the few things that's up, the VIX, uh, the volatility index, um, that trading up 15% as we head into the close. You know, when we look across the board here, Jared, what do you make of the market action? Uh, I'm actually getting pretty bullish. I mean, stuff is getting down to levels that is pretty attractive. Now, having you know, having said that, like me personally, I'm pretty fully invested as it is, so I don't have a lot of ammo. Um, you know, but I, the stuff I'm looking at is... Um, I mean, biotech, biotech is down like 70% from the highs. The XBI is trading at 65. You know, people thought it was a big deal when it traded below 100. Um, You know, two weeks ago, I saw that 20% of the XBI was trading for less than cash on the balance sheet. That was two weeks ago. It's got to be 30 or 40% now. Kind of reminds me of 2002 when you saw a lot of the dot-com stocks were trading for less than cash. That was pretty close to an opportunity in July of 2002. So we're, you know, the s and is down about 17% at this point. I, I think we're getting down to tag ends, and I think we're going to get a rally in the next couple of days. Wow. So you kind of feel like we're at that capitulation point because people have been looking for that, right? I know biotech, some people have been feeling that way. I don't know if you do about, you know, some of the ARC names, not the ARC fund itself, but sort of that, you know, that sort of tech play. But every time they've tried to step in, they're kind of getting their face ripped off. Yeah. I mean, capitulation, you know, everybody likes to look for capitulation. It's uh, it's elusive. I I don't I don't know if we'll get the ultimate capitulation in the next couple of days, but I think we'll get a tradable bounce probably tomorrow or the day after. Uh, I think it's going to be a pretty impulsive move. This is just sort of, you know, my spidey sense, you know, for trading the markets for a while. Um, you know, the Arc Fund is what is it down from the highs like 70, 80 percent, something like that. It's pretty yeah. close. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think there's some opportunities here. Uh, one of the things I like to do in in times like this is to sell puts because volatility is jacked. You get a lot for selling puts. Um, you know, you pick a strike that's like twenty percent down, and you know that's that's a good way to make money in this environment. So, yeah, this you know the, the markets like this don't really bother me a lot. I don't really get emotional about it. Uh, I'm lo- I mean, there's no way anybody's making money. Let's put it that way. But, you know, I'm losing money. A lot of people are losing money. Yeah. But I think this is uh, I think it's temporary. So I think something that's really important, and by the way, one of the one of the things I love about the show is that we get to talk live and interact with the audience. And I think a lot of people are really looking for help as they try to understand these markets because they have been so volatile. And like you said, so many of us are, you know, watching our whether it be a 401 or active daily trading account, just, you know, have these swings and really get hit to the downside. And it makes a lot of people nervous. So um, if you're listening and you have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. I'm going to try to get to as many of them as I can on a day like today. Um, But Jared, do you, uh, I think time horizon is really important here, right? So you just said something before where there is a tradable bounce. So if you're looking at nibbling at some of this stuff, is this is this in your short term trading and you have to be really nimble and you might get out of them? Or are you looking at some of these opportunities as maybe a longer term investing opportunity for names that haven't been this low in a long time? Yeah, I mean, kind of both, kind of both. I mean, for example, biotech, I think if you bought biotech here and held it for three years, I think there's almost no chance you would be down. You know, I mean, so the, I mean, it's really at distressed levels. And when you're talking about names that are distressed, like, yeah, I mean, these are really good opportunities. Um I mean, the one thing I want to mention is this is very important. 
So we're in sort of a bear market. The spoos are down 17%. 20% is a bear market. Okay. So the, the question you have to ask yourself is, is this going to be a great bear market like 29 and 74 and 01 and 08 where the stocks are down 50%? Or is this just going to be a garden variety bear market where we're down 15 or 20%? And we've had a bunch of those over the years. And I think this is just a garden variety bear market. Uh, and I think, the, I, I think the Fed here is is going to ease off at some point in the near future. I think you're going to hear some dovish noises out of the Fed because, you know, they're going to they're going to get political pressure about stocks going down as, as much as they are going to get political pressure about inflation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the the front end of the yield curve is already pricing this in twos, threes and fives are rallying. You know, they're telling you that the Fed is going to ease off. So I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, though, because they've kind of like, I don't want to say box themselves in the corner, but they, they, they are, you know, so sort of tied into the political situation around inflation um, and whether it's coming criticism coming from politicians or from, you know, former Federal Reserve officials or, uh, you know, whether it's Bill Dudley or Lawrence Summers or, you know, economists. I mean, there, there's, you know, a whole chorus of critics everywhere talking about how behind the curve they are. And now they really got to, you know, make up that ground. Um what is it going to take for them to to switch off the inflation narrative and on to the fact that uh oh okay you know we're slowing down faster than we expected uh the, the whole argument from some of those some people is that it's not they're not going to do it this time but you think they will yeah i mean you have to watch unemployment i mean that's really that's what they care about the most uh so the unemployment rate is 3.6% i think if you had a couple of ugly payroll numbers uh, if you saw the rate uh, tick up to 3.8, 4.0%, if the jobs picture starts to get worse, you see this Fed still does cares way more about recession and unemployment than it does about inflation. If they have to choose between the two, they will try to stop a recession. Right now, the Fed, they, in their own words, has said they're looking for the soft landing. They're trying to slow down inflation without causing a recession. They cause a recession. They are. I think. I think there's almost no chance they get Fed funds up to three percent, and that's what's priced in for March of 2023. March Fed funds is at three percent. I think there's no chance they get there. Yeah. So Kyle asking on the RV site, have Treasuries bottomed? Oh, I believe they have. You know, I bought Treasuries two weeks ago, a uh, little bit early, but I'm not. I'm not down all that much. Um, I. You know. It, <sighs> treasuries, stocks, and gold are all the same trade at this point. They're all correlated. It's all the same trade. And it's all about what the Fed is going to do. So yeah, I, I think that treasuries are, have either bottomed or are in the process of bottoming. Max Runkel is asking from the RV site, um, this, this speaks to your, you know, the pivot that you're expecting from the Fed. What breaks for the Fed to reverse? Is it high yield, CDs? What are you watching? Um, it's going to be a couple things. Uh, it's going to be a deterioration of the economic data. So, you know, ISM peaked at about 62. It's now at 55 and coming down. Um, you it, take a look at durable goods orders and construction spending and stuff like that. That is peaking and is going to roll over. So, you know, the Fed, look, I mean, the Fed saw the inflation data for months and just totally ignored it. They're not going to ignore the recession data. But it's really about it's about the narrative and it's about political pressure. I was on Twitter today and, you know, that little what's happening box on the right, you know, where like Twitter yeah. puts in articles. So one of the things it puts in there was Jim Jordan, who's the representative from Ohio that like never puts his jacket on like he's in these committee hearings, like in his shirt all the time. So he said, like, don't you wish like Trump was president for your 401k or something like that? And. Like, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of the political pressure on the Fed because, you know, as much as they want to stop inflation, like, if people lose 20, 30 percent of their net worth of their retirement savings, like, that is going to add to the political pressure. Yeah, ab absolutely. And great spot and great call, Jared, because I, I don't see how, I mean, just we know anecdotally from talking, 
I'm sure, you know, this is what we're all talking about, right? Everyone's, you know, freaked out about that. And, you know, how do you recover from that drawdown? Um, to your point um, and to that question about, you know, if the Fed goes too much and the pressure, if we start to see deterioration, um, Raul sat down with uh, Pierre Onderon in the latest installment of our special series on the risks of a global recession. We rolled it out last week. We're doing it again this week. More interviews coming in. Pierre, for those who don't know, is the chief investment officer at Onderon Capital, one of the world's really most well-respected commodity experts. He had some really interesting and, and worrying things to say about the risks to the financial system itself. Let's have a listen to that clip. You've talked a few times, you've, you've dropped the word global financial crisis. Do you think that is the risk here? I mean, the, the financial crisis changed the backdrop for commodities last time around because China kind of changed its role and then we rolled into the EU crisis and we got stuck with lower demand for a period of time. Do you think we're going into a financial crisis because of what's going on? Because this is a tightening of financial conditions and people are going to blow up? I think we'll have to. I mean, it's hard to know the timing of it, but it's like kind of hard to have a, a soft landing when we get, you know, when there's so much geopolitical risk and supply risk in commodities. And when even when everything's going well, we get the supply growth is going to be less than potential demand growth. So in general, um, the way I understand the world a little bit that, you know, um, it follows, you know, the financial market where we think everything's fine and things go up, everything looks fine until it's not, and then it gets worse and worse, and then we panic, and then it, and, and then it brings, you know, it brings us to a collapse. So it's hard to, you know, to get like some, just some like machine. It's actually a lot of things need to go right to just have a mild recession. So generally, the market gets you know stays bullish for too long, and we get you know asset prices you know disconnecting from reality, becoming way too high, and eventually you get a repricing and then a panic that brings us much lower, and then eventually hopefully a recovery. But it's going to be unstable. I think you know the kind of market moves we've had in commodities over the last few months. It's all, not only due to Russia. It's going to be uh, very volatile for a long time, and eventually have an impact on on equities as well. And that full interview is available on our website to all Essential Plus and Pro members. Uh, and there'll be information, I hope, in the chat where you can um, find that entire series um, if you're not a member and you want to be able to check it out. Um, Jared, is, that, is, is this something we should be worried about? Not just that we see a, you know, a bear market or further losses in stocks, that we see uh, the potential for growth slowdown. Could it be something more serious that something starts to to, to sort of break under the weight of these higher interest rates? Uh, probably not. I don't think so. But because I mean, rates have peaked. Is yeah, that I mean, let's look at it this way. So you have if it, it, it's it'll only happen if there's a deleveraging, right? So the the government's not in danger of deleveraging. Households are not really leveraged. The corporate sector is very leveraged. So really, the only reason you would have some kind of disorderly deleveraging is if we did go into a deep recession and you had a lot of corporate defaults and corp, you know, spreads blew out on corporate bonds. Like that's that's really the that's that's where a lot of the leverage is. But I don't think we're going to get to that point. Well, that's reassuring. Uh, to that to that uh, issue, Max. Um, also asking, I think this is really good. He was the one who asked before where it shows up, um, but I just want to do this follow-up part of the question. Is there counterparty dealer risk that could be systemic in Bitcoin's collapse? Like, let's just remind everyone that, um, as I mentioned really quickly at the top, we still saw big losses again, um, you know, in cryptocurrency. We know they're trading like a risk asset. Um, you know, they're a little bit off their lows, actually. Now it's down about, I'm looking, eight and, and change, nine and change um, for Bitcoin and Ethereum. But that issue of counterparty risk is really interesting. I don't know the answer to that question because I don't know a lot about the derivatives market for crypto. I don't really know the structure of that market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I only pay attention to spot. You know, I pay attention to spot Bitcoin, spot Ethereum, but I don't really know what kind of derivative exposure there is out there uh, and where that exposure lives. So I can't really say. Yeah, I fear that maybe a lot a, a lot of people don't. <laughs> that's the way that's the worry with a newish market. Right. Um, so hopefully we don't find out the hard way. Uh, Paul English on the exchange saying what the bleep is going on with gold, silver, copper, uranium, lithium lithium recently, including today. 
Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just talk about gold specifically. So, you know, I'm a big investor in gold and, um, I mean, for, for all the panic about gold, I mean, let's just put this in perspective, okay? So back in 2008, when Bear Stearns collapsed, gold was at $1,000 an ounce. And then fast forward like seven or eight months later, during the financial crisis, it was at $700 an ounce. So gold took a 30% drawdown. And everybody in the middle of the financial crisis was saying, why the hell is gold not going up? It's down 30%. That was a 30% drawdown. Gold does this all the time. You know, you have these situations where gold should be going up. It's not. The drawdown that gold has right now is pretty benign. It's only about 13%, you know, and it's still above the point from where it broke out above the wedge pattern. So I look, I'm not going to be really worried until it gets below 1800. So do you feel like it could, it could still go higher and be a safe haven for people who are looking protection, despite the fact that we see these periods where when you think it should initially go up, it doesn't. I mean, it's outperforming stocks, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, like everybody, you know, what's funny is like gold people, they're not glass half full people. They're not glass half empty people. They're glass tipped over people. Like they're the most pessimistic people in the world. So it's really, it, I really think it's going to be okay. <laughs> I love that. Uh, we um, we have a question about cash as well, uh, because that's, you know, that's been the other thing. I mean, I know people have been talking about this, but Kyle on the RV site saying, how much cash should we hold at this point? Well, I think the amount of cash you should hold is pretty constant in all market environments. I think it's about 20%. I mean, that's, you know, that's what I, that's what I keep all the time, give or take. And that's, you know, what I have in my awesome portfolio allocation, uh, you hold cash for a bunch of different reasons. And one of the reasons you hold cash is to take advantage of opportunities. You know, as we talked about, you know, earlier in the segment, you know, I think we're getting close to the point where there's some opportunities out there. So if you're fully invested and you don't have any cash, you're going to miss out on these opportunities. This is why you have cash. So I'm never too concerned about what inflation is or, you know, how much you're losing. If you hold cash, you always have to hold some. Yeah, Kyle had a follow up. If you're fully invested, how much insurance do you like to keep here? Well, the interesting thing is, is that I don't have any insurance at this point. Okay, so um, I literally, when the S and P was on the highs, like in December, uh, I bought quite a few S and P puts, uh, and then during the first sell off, when the market was down about ten percent, I sold those puts. And the problem, see, that's the problem with having a hedge because you have to decide when to monetize the hedge. Mm. And once you monetize the hedge, then you don't have a hedge anymore. You know, so I made the decision to do that a couple of months ago, and now I don't have a hedge. Having said that, you know, the VIX, what, what is it right now, like 35 or something like that? But like volatility has not really gone up a lot. And if you have a hedge in the S&P or the NASDAQ or something like that, you don't make a lot of money on the Delta. What you really make a lot of money is on the Vega. So when volatility explodes, that's when a hedge really becomes valuable. And that hasn't happened yet. And I, I kind of think it's not going to happen. Yeah, that's a great point. I thought, is there is there a level where you would say like, okay, we're getting to that point at the VIX. You know, it's been going higher. It's kind of been, you know, it's obviously today it's up some 15. It's at 34 uh, 0.75. So it's, it's 15% is a big move in a day, but some people are saying like, listen, I, I, it's not at 40, you know, so I'm not that worried about it. Is there a level you watch where you're like, okay, this is, you know, this is telling me something else is happening here. I mean, once you get above 40, I think that kind of tells you that there's panic, you know what I yeah. mean? Okay. And during the, you know, during the pandemic in March of 2020, I don't remember exactly where it got to, but I think it was above 80. You know, just to put that in perspective. So it's it's this is very different. Yeah, that, and that and it is great because we do tend to forget. So that 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 is really telling that we're sitting at thirty four point seven five. So interesting. So you know, it, it sounds like you you sort of take some comfort in that, thinking like maybe this isn't going to get. We're kind of hitting the bottom. It's not going to blow up in this disastrous mess. Bloomberg wrote a piece on the Bloomberg, uh, you know, site today, there was a piece um, suggesting that it was citing some uh, research from Morgan Stanley, I believe. And it was suggesting that, you know, professionals like hedge funds have been selling or reducing exposure, but the day trading kind of retail crowd hasn't really yet, um, but they're getting really hard hit. And the 
suggestion or the worry was that they could start to exit in mass. Um, you know, they've kind of been holding, employing that same strategy that they have previously, but, you know, they're wondering and that the folks at Morgan Stanley put it together, kind of wondering whether that would last. What is your sense? And does that matter? Is that, do you see that as a risk? I don't really have a good feel for retail involvement here. Like, I mean, look, if you go back to early 2021, I mean, that's when retail sentiment was peaking. Uh, I would, I, if I were to guess, I would say that, you know, retail day trading is probably down about 70% since, since then. All you have to do is look at Robinhood stock to see that. Um, but, you know, I will say that, you know, retail will, I think Morgan Stanley is right. I, you know, retail will sell on the lows. So, you know, if ARC is at 40 and ultimately it goes to 20, they'll sell it at 20. You know, that's always how it plays out. Yeah, which is always what's unfortunate um, as well, because, you know, we lose we lose generation and generational wealth that way. So hopefully, um, you know, they're taking advantage of all, all this advice, including from folks like you and um, really trying to think about this strategically. I, I love this. Um, this question is from Green Avocado on YouTube. Triple top on the DXY. Do you think we're going higher? I mentioned the VIX was up before. Of course, the other thing that's been up relentlessly is the U.S. dollar. Yeah, I would be careful with the dollar here. I, I mean, I would say, you know, I've been following this for a while, and I kind of lean dollar bearish all the time. Like, I, I just that's just my bias. You know, we all have biases. Having said that, I think that the dollar bullish argument is the most consensus it has ever been that I've ever seen. Like, I think it's most consensus right now. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the usual sp suspects. I'm not talking about like, you know, Brent and people like that. Like, I'm just, you know, when I look on Twitter, I mean, I see there's real consensus that the dollar is going to keep going higher. So I think that might surprise people here in the short term. That that uh, that it does not go higher. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Do you see a sharp reversal or? I see a sharp reversal. Like sharp, I see sharp reversal. So yeah. Is it connected to what's ha the, to the fact that you think the Fed that the economy is going to slow sharply? Inflation Ab absolutely has absolutely it is absolutely yeah. I mean it like really like the the Fed is at the center of this. Okay, if you think I'm wrong. If you think that the Fed is committed to fighting inflation, that they're going to raise rate to 3% and beyond, then you should do the opposite of everything I say. You should do, do the absolute opposite. Because it, this is it's all dependent on the thesis and the reaction function of the Fed. So, I think that's so important, what you just said, Jared, because as we've been talking about um, both in this series, and, and we're, we're going to be doing a lot more on this, um, throughout Real Vision, Real Vision is you have to understand what your framework is, your macro framework, right? You you need to have some sense of what you believe to be true on that and then adjust everything else accordingly. Um, because as you said, you have one, but maybe somebody else might not agree. But it's really important to establish that and try to figure out, you know, what what argument or what framework makes sense to you before you can start to put a lot of the other um, pieces in place. Uh, Matthew H. from the RV site, employment is a lagging indicator. Won't it be too late for the Fed to pivot when recession is more obvious to the electorate? Well, the, the Fed that we currently have is reactive, not proactive, and they're always late. I mean, they were super late on inflation. They'll be super late on this. Um, I think they will be more proactive when it comes to recession because they're more attuned to that. Um, but if you go back to, you know, I started my career in 99, you know, so the Greenspan Fed and, uh, you know, the Greenspan Fed was less consensus. It, it wasn't really dependent so much on the Board of Governors. It was really just Greenspan making decisions. And he was very proactive. Uh, you know, if he saw the data start to turn, the Fed would act immediately. Um, and that, you know, that proactiveness has basically all but disappeared over time. Uh, and now it's a slow moving bureaucratic institution. Yeah. And in fact, he was famous, right, Greenspan, for all these sort of indicators that he looked at that he thought gave him a front edge on. Um, we used to have to track them all, track them all down and follow them because he because he would look at all these um, sort of parts of the economy to try to figure out what's going on. Uh we have a question. Um, 
does retail even have, this is from Craig on the RV site, does retail even have a big sway on the market, especially since they've been in smaller stocks? I mean, you sort of said you're not really tracking them. If you're not worried about it, it sounds like you don't think there's this outsized influence they now have, despite the fact we saw them move around some of the meme stocks from time to time. No, I mean, you know, retail only has an influence in markets under very specific circumstances. And I've only seen it twice in my career. So once in 99 and 2000 yeah. and once in 2021, and that's pretty much it. You know, and, and everybody knows what happened with GameStop in 2021, uh, you know, where retail beat the hedge funds. Like that is, that is very rare. It doesn't happen very often. And it's usually accompanied by mania in stocks. So, you know, I really, I don't even think it's worth talking about. I mean, I really don't think it's much of an influence at all. Yeah, that's a great, that's a really great point, Jared. Uh, Mark from the RV site asking, is Jared deflationary with energy? Am I deflationary with energy? I, th I think, do you think that, if I, if I understand, Mark, I'm going to guess you mean that, do you think um, energy is going to come, commodities are going to come down, or do you believe we're in some sort of energy super cycle, which I, I think if, if you listen to the Pierre interview, he thinks this is much more sustained for longer, given some of the supply situations. Yeah, I would agree with him. I mean, I think we're in the commodity super cycle. And what, we, what we've experienced, I would say, in the last three weeks is sort of a deflationary impulse. You know, commodities have come down a little bit, mm. uh, not just oil, but also the metals and the ags and everything is everything is corrected slightly. Uh, but I think that's in the context of a much larger bull market over the course of many years. So. Yeah. So does this, Jared, mean that we get bouts of volatility? Uh, because if you have, th there's that old saying, right? Hi, uh, the cure for high prices is high prices. You see demand destruction, but if you're in a super cycle, that is only going to pull it down so far before that sort of those tight supplies, if not put a floor, kind of bounce it back up again. So do you see more volatility in that space? Um. I don't know. It's hard to get much more volatility than we got in oil about a month ago. So, so true. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> I'm not sure my memory is, but no, I mean, you know, it feels like it's hard to parse out what's going on because there are so many cross currents. So, you know, but, but, you know, listen, that may be the, the situation we're in uh, for the foreseeable future. Great question from Sean Daw. Uh, is Jared taking the current event situation in China into his assessment? Could that not worsen the current slide? Thank you so much. And just to put an exclamation point on that for you, Sean, um, data out today, I don't know if everyone caught it, showed China's export growth went from 14.7 in March, just down to 3.9% in April. You know, obviously we have the COVID shuts shutdowns there, but there is some concern that China's economy may be a lot more fragile um, or maybe weaker, not just due to the COVID shutdowns. Um, is that something that you're looking at, Jared? Yeah, I mean, that'll take a couple of months to transmit to the U.S., um, I will say that I think relative to most people, I spend less time looking at China than most people, mm. um, you know, because it's a black box and the data is bad and it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, the COVID lockdowns and the supply chain issues and all that stuff, like for sure, that has an impact. Mm. Uh, I, have, I have to ask you this because... Um... Because this is going to happen, I think, every time you're on now, Jared. Um, but Zorin from the RV site asks, any advice for the uranium a-holes out there? <laughs> Jared has a, a, a very deep relationship now with all all things uranium. <laughs> yeah, some of those guys got really mad at me last week. But I, I think, I, well, he put a smiley face. He or yeah. she put a smiley face. So I think some of them um, are enjoying it, though. So I have I have not looked at any of the charts in the last couple of weeks. I, I, know that, I know that the uranium charts are off like 20, 25%. Um, I, st I still think it's a good trade. I do. Um, you know, all my comment at the time was it was just getting too crowded. It was getting way too crowded. So we worked off some of the speculative frenzy and yeah, I mean, I, let me put it this way. I mean, if, if this guy is a uranium investor, like, I don't think you should sell now. Let's put it that way. Perfect. Uh, DD on YouTube and thank Jared, you're just whipping through these questions with me. I love it because they are so good and really touching on so many different markets. Um, DD from YouTube saying, when do European stocks tank? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, it's funny because 
uh, a lot of smart people were talking about, um, you know, energy prices and nat gas and oil and stuff like that, the energy that comes from Russia. Um, and they were predicting that, you know, Europe would crash like 20% or something like that. Hasn't happened. Uh, I, the, only, the only part of Europe that I watch is France uh, because I have some puts on EWQ that I put on in advance of the election. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't act very good. So I don't, maybe it's just a slow moving trade that plays out over the course of, you know, a lot of people were looking at you, you know, we had this huge outperformance of us over Europe over the last five years, this massive outperformance. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were looking for that to reverse. And maybe that's not, maybe it's not going to happen. I mean, maybe that trend is just going to continue. Yeah. Um, you're right. So many people had been making that call and then, you know, uh, who could have foreseen the circumstances that we're looking at now? And um, I, we mentioned the dollar strength, a lot of people looking at parity for the euro and um, massive changes in budgeting in Europe. So there's a lot going on. There I, I don't think parity for the euro is going to happen. It's really? also two consensus. It's it, way too many people believe that. Yeah. Jared, this is why we love to have you on. Awesome insight. I think we covered just about every market out there. Fantastic questions from all of you. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. We're going to be back same time tomorrow. Um, with Tommy Thornton. And we have some really exciting news here at Real Vision. Raul Powell is releasing his first podcast. Um, I can't believe he doesn't have one yet, but he doesn't. But we're going to get that out. Uh, and it's going to cover a really wide range of topics. We're super excited. Here's a little taste of what you can expect. Yeah, I was DJing somewhere, woke up, and boom, I was in the metaverse. I didn't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I think the coolest thing about NFTs is that for creators like me, for writers, and I'm sure, you know, across the spectrum of creativity, artists, photographers, or whatever, can have a community of people who are invested in it, who are with you on this ride, and now have access to you, and you have access to them. And that's just, to me, it's, it's revolutionary. Regulation has stymied the development or the adoption of digital assets by some of these large scale financial institutions. Boston Consultant Group has a great stat on this. From 2009 to 2016, European and North American banks were collectively fined $321 billion by regulators. I mean, just an eye watering number. I had lived through the financial crisis and predicted it. I had also lived through the European crisis and predicted it and had been in Europe and had to buy a generator and food and get cash out of the bank and keep it at home. Right, that's how close we were in Spain to losing our entire banking system.